scripture lesson this morning is taken from Paul's letter to the church at Colossae, so it's called Colossians chapter 3 verses 12 to 17 and I especially want you to focus on the last phrase. Here he's talking about what's expected of us as followers of Jesus and that we should exhibit differences of, in behavior because of that. But then he talks about singing as offering praise to God, many different aspects of it. That's key, that's central. So here I, I offer now chapter three, verses 12 to 17. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Now that's a tall order. Expectations are high. Bear with one another, and if anybody has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you. So you must also forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the Lord of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God. Here ends our reading of God's holy word. May the power of that word Awaken us.
before we sing our next hymn, we're going to dedicate our sound system. And so, I would like to invite Audrey Brown to come forward. Come on up, or come on down. You. You. That's right. I didn't tell you about this because I knew you wouldn't show up, so you have to come down and be with me up front. <laughs> All you have to do is stand here and smile. <laughs> okay. Okay. Just don't hit me with the cane, please. <laughs> do you need a chair or do you want to stand? No, I can stand. Okay. As long as you help me. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Some of you don't know this lady. This lady is Audrey Brown. Audrey's been a member of this church before I was here. So that means it's been a long time. And Audrey has always had an eye for things. She's been, been very generous. She loves music. She's given generously to repairs of the piano, upgrades, and different things. Enough. And, enough? OK, OK. You got that cane over there now, please. Yeah. OK, OK, behave. <laughs> 10, 12 years ago, she said, we needed an upgrade to our sound system. So she donated $5,000. You did. <laughs> Would you like to make it 10? <laughs> she did. You better quit while you're ahead. I know. <laughs> she had vision, and she knew. And we had hoped that others might follow suit. But as some of you who, know, who were here then, things were really tight financially. We were sort of going from hand to mouth year after year after year because we built the new building. And things were just tight, and the money just didn't come. A few other people gave another 5000 but it was spread out over many. And we had 10000 in the bank for years. And finally, Doug Gaff, who's our engineer, sound master, uh, up in the balcony, said, you know, we've been waiting too long. We've got to get this ball rolling again. And so I approached John Keith. And I said, we need $10,000 to get this going. And he said, here's 15. He's not here, and I'm not sure why, but we'll get him again sometime. But Audrey got it started, and her generosity meant that it would never go away. And we all, every church needs someone like that to start something, and then to put some cash or their time behind it to make it happen. Nothing happens without that. Don't talk too long. Don't talk too long. I'll take it out of my sermon, okay? I can't, I can't stand here too long. You can't stand much longer? You want that chair so I can speak longer? No, no. no. Okay. All right. Well, a year ago, we started installing it. And this gentleman off to my right, Ian, would you just stand for a second, Ian? I recognize him. He's one of the installers. And he just happened to come this Sunday not knowing we were going to dedicate the system. So, you know, it's a sign of the Holy Spirit. Thanks for being here. And this system, this system has transformed the way sound is transmitted in here. But also, yeah, <laughs> but also, we have the ability now to put our sermons online. People can watch it as afterwards and see a recording of it. One of my friends, Wild Bill Hamilton, who's a pastor, he said, I love watching your sermons online, but you need a makeup artist. Your forehead <laughs> is glowing. And I said, thank you, Bill. And so um, it's one thing to put out a written copy of your sermon. It's another thing for people to hear and to see not just me, but you when you sing or children. And so it's magnifying our ministry. Some of you and others in the years to come are going to get their first contact with our church online. And we were way behind. And now we're catching up. There's more things we can do, streaming and other things, things that I don't fully understand, so I won't talk about them. But we are on the road. And we're becoming much more current with what's going on. But you started it. And so I want to read this. You start a lot of things. You start a lot of things. That's right. <laughs> I want to read this plaque that we're going to put up on the wall here. And this said, the sound system in this church was given through the generosity of Audrey Brown in honor of her parents, Ethel and Arthur Brown, 
and John Keith, in loving memory of his mother, Frances Wheeler Keith, dedicated in November 2013. So a long time from now, people are going to come in and they're going to see that, and they're going to say, that was smart. This sound system has blessed us for years. So we want to say thank you, and we want to say we thank you for your vision, your generosity, and your big heart, and your sense of humor, because you, you've been up here with me for five minutes now, and you're still smiling. That's pretty good. But my knees are croaking. Your knees are croaking. Okay. Well, I... You have enough? I was fascinated to read that archaeologists believe they have found the oldest musical instrument ever found before. It's a 35,000-year-old flute made from a hollow bird's, a bone and a bird's wing with holes drilled into it. Obviously, the only purpose would be that it was a musical instrument. Now, that's 35,000 years ago, before the Ice Age, Neanderthals, mammoths were still around, 20,000 years before human beings made it to the New World. It's a long time ago. And yet, we might think of them as primitive. They, were just, they had just the same brain capacity we did, you know, but they had a different life. They were hunter-gatherers. Huh. And they valued music. And around the same time, the paintings in the Lascaux Caves in France that have been discovered and have shocked us with their beauty because they're so old and their preservation, locked inside this innermost sanctum of a cave, around the same time, it's almost like there was another renaissance, and there's probably others, long before the, 14th, the 15th century arrived in Italy. So I share with you now some words about this from Reverend Quinn Caldwell. And he points out that there are 5,400 species on Earth that vocalize complex, intentional, repeatable musical sounds. 5,400 species do that. Only one of those species lives on land. Most are in the trees, birds. Some live under the water, whales. Some live under the ground, one lives on the ground us. And we are the only one of those 5,400 species that has the gift of rhythm, which means we can sing together. Birds can sing and chirp and cheep and do their songbird thing, but they're not together. And heaven help us, they can't harmonize at all. Some of us can. Some of us can't. <laughs> but genetically, we're, we've got the capability. <laughs> um, so, Scientists have found that when people sing together, they usually wind up breathing together, the same cadence. Now, most musical pieces have pauses that are prepared that way, but it's interesting that without thinking about it, we all get on the same cadence, so it brings us together. Other researchers have found that if there's a strong enough bass note section, that our hearts will also start beating in the same rhythm. Isn't that interesting? So in a sense, music and singing have a way of bringing us together that seems almost like a religious experience in and of itself. The power of music and singing we cannot describe fully. If the ancients were to come from the past and look at us now and focus on music, they would wonder what so many individuals are doing with headphones, listening to music all by themselves or in their cars, or home watching a concert on TV with the doors closed. Music was something that was communal. It was supposed to bring us together, hold us together, heal us together, and bring us together with God. They understood that. It was a gift. It was unique to them, and they saw it as sacred because it helped them experience the transcendent. See, singing, we often think of as something children do, but it's really not just for kids. It's for us. I saw a poster in an Alzheimer unit, and it said, when drugs fail to help, and then it listed how 
playing a musical instrument or painting or singing can often do wonders to help bring someone out of a fog and help them to rejoin life in a more productive way. Medicine isn't the only answer. Music has great power to heal. I remember a woman named Elsie who was in the church I served previously. And when I got there, she was in her 90s and she was losing her memories. She couldn't, she didn't know any of her family anymore. She couldn't speak. But when they sang, Jesus loves me, this I know, she would sing with them. That's something. If they recited it, she would not recite it. If they said the Lord's Prayer, the 23rd Psalm, she would not respond. But when they sang, Jesus loves me, this I know, she knew it. And she would sing it with them. And it was like it was a key that unlocked her darkness and helped them to connect. Think about it. Perhaps her earliest memory, the last one she lost, was interwoven with a tune, with a song that touched her soul. We think of the ancients as rather primitive sometimes. Some of their practices were. But in terms of emphasis on singing, sometimes we think we've outgrown that a little bit. Or maybe we've just, you know, it's a little too, um, it's too demanding. We're a little bit more dignified than singing like that. And I wonder, have we outgrown it? I don't think so. I think our need and our programming is still the same. We've forgotten. The Psalms, remember, the book of Psalms is one of the biggest chapters of books in the Bible, is the hymn book of the Hebrew people. All of those Psalms were poems, but they were intended to be sung. And you'll read, if you read them, you'll see there's times when let the lute and the cymbal clang and and, and musical instruments were accompanying them even as they marched to, to worship. They were singing on the way. They were so happy to go and worship God. They were filled with the spirit and they found singing and music the best way to express it. So they were psyched getting ready for worship. Music wasn't just an add on you know, or something that helps entertain or is a break in the action of the words. It was essential at the very heart of it. Now, sometimes people, when I meet with them and they're planning a funeral, will get into the whole issue of music. And it's very important for them to have certain selections as the post prelude and the postlude. Sometimes they will ask to have a soloist sing some of the real favorite chestnuts. How great thou art, amazing grace, the Lord's Prayer. And sometimes I'll say, do you want any hymn singing, any congregational singing? And most people will say no. And usually it's because they're not sure they'll be able to sing. And they find that it might be you know, kind of awkward to have a hymn in which so many people get choked up and can't sing. So they just say, let's not do that. And I understand that. I understand it very well. But I think sometimes we think that music makes us cry. I don't think so. I think the tears are already there. And sometimes we insulate ourselves from that. And sometimes it's the music we need to connect us with a part of ourselves that we've said, I don't know if I want to be there. The only way to heal is to be there. Not live there, but not forget it. The ancients knew that singing can help us to feel almost overwhelmed by God. And they knew that was a good thing because life is hard. Life deals out many wounds. And sometimes we wonder if we'll ever get over them. And yet, friends, hugs, talks, and sometimes singing together cuts through to the depths of our hearts. You know what the, the piece of music that causes the most tears? The wedding march. Play the wedding march and out come the hankies. Of course, some people have married for 25 years and they say, I was happy back then and now I'm not so sure. So they're crying for a different reason. But the wedding march, <laughs> the wedding march touches, touches the tears. But I think that the number two must be taps. We just buried a man. And my mind just went blank. <laughs> Grant Law. And his mother, I buried 
20 years ago, and he had served in the Air Force, and they had the honor guard, and they played taps. And it's very hard to maintain composure when taps plays, because taps has a way of going. See, we have two different songs, two different kinds of situations, and both have power to touch the heart. I've never heard anybody say, we don't want to have the wedding march. It's, it makes us cry, or no, we don't want taps. It's too upsetting. They want it, because we have to touch certain realities. Taps, dignified, honor, you know, and we're saying goodbye to someone who served well. And it hurts to say goodbye, and it brings us up with a flood of memories. Those two songs will be part of our lives forever. In the ancient times, if you were in a tribe and you were suffering from depression and you went to the, the shaman, sometimes called a medicine man or the mystic, you would go to him or her and ask for help. And usually they would ask you four questions. When did you become uncomfortable with silence? Not what you expected to hear. When did you stop being enchanted by the power of story? When did you stop dancing? And they didn't mean rock and roll or the waltz. They were talking about the communal dancing around the fire in which you seek to express some of your deepest things and reverence to God in body, language. And finally, the most important question, when did you stop singing? When did you stop singing? When did that song in your heart get muted? When did you cut yourself off from the powers of renewal that were right there in community? Hey, singing and music have incredible power to heal and make us whole. One of our young women went to a vacation Bible school one summer, several years ago now, and of course, at Vacation Bible School, there's lots of camp-type singing. They sang a lot of gospel stuff, and it was just upbeat, and she loved it. She came home, and she said, Mom, that school is so full of God. Isn't that profound? She was maybe eight or 10. That school is full of God because of the singing. It just lifted her, the power of song. I'm going to go back to Reverend Quinn Caldwell again because he points out something else near the end of his article. He said, all species stop singing when they are in danger. When danger approaches, they clam up. You go in the forest and you know, if you don't hear anything, that there's a hawk around or something else around that them, threatens them. But he said, that's not true for us. We sing despite the danger. We sing to give us strength in the face of the danger. So if we're confronting racism, we sing, we shall overcome. If we're facing fear, we sing songs like, it is well with my soul. If we're facing war, we may sing silent night because it puts us in touch with the depths that go deeper than any conflict. And when we're confronted by death, we sing hymns like, Christ the Lord is risen today, that there's more. I wish I hadn't lost my loved one, but there's more. And I need to cling to that, and music helps. But despite all this information, there's still some folks who say, I, I don't want to really sing boisterously in church. I don't feel dignified. Or that's for girly men. Yeah. And so I just want you to know, we have a hidden video camera. We've been videotaping you for several weeks. And so if you want to see yourself stone-faced while everybody else is singing, just check out the website this week and you can sign on and say, hey, there I am. <laughs> see, I have to look at that every Sunday, you see. No, this, it's about time you did. And <laughs> Psalm 100, if you say, I can't carry a tune, that's fine. You know why? Because Psalm 100 says, doesn't say you must sing in harmony, you must sing a beautiful tune, you must be a solo. It says, come to church or come to worship and make a joyful noise. You can all make a joyful noise. I know that. And I must admit, this isn't just a scolding, because some people find our music hard to sing. They find the words archaic. They find the tunes unfamiliar. They have other kinds of music that lifts them, whether it's gospel, bluegrass, or 
or the, some of the evangelical music out there that lifts them and touches them in their soul. So we don't have the corner on the music market, okay? We must admit that. But now, in honor of today, I want you to all stand up. And I want Jeff Nutting and Frank to hand, oh, John, to hand out the last hymn. We're not going to sing it yet, but I want you to have it. And our choir is going to help us with our last hymn. They have been prepared. They're going to boost us from the balcony. But while this is going on, I want you all to pay attention. We're going to sing God Bless America, like we mean it. OK? God bless America. Okay? It's a matter of what we sing, isn't it? And what touches our heart. And that's an old favorite. And we'll never forget it. Okay. Now, I want you now to transplant yourself to another place that some people consider a house of worship for them, and that's Fenway Park. <laughs> and the way things have been going in Boston lately, you know, people feel that that place should glow and we want, don't want to change how we feel because we just won the World Series and everything's great. Life goes on, and we're part of that life. Okay, now, church throughout the centuries has been smart. They would take a catchy song, and they would change the words and make them sacred, and that's what I've done. This, <laughs> Matthew's going to play Sweet Caroline, you know, the seventh inning stretch at Boston. Yeah, he's going to play it, and you're going to sing these words. And you're going to sing them boldly, and you're going to sing them in time, because you have been given the gift of rhythm by God, and you're going to use it. Now, Matthew's going to get us going. He's going to give us a bar of it first, and then we're going to come in. And the videotape's running. <laughs>
Final exam is next Sunday. <laughs> and if you don't live up to the standards today, we'll do this again and again until you catch on. Seriously, isn't it feel good to sing with your heart and your body? And isn't it good to just get pumped up and know we're doing it together? Yeah, it really does. So thank you. God, you've touched us with the reality of your presence as we have prayed, as we have remembered, as we have given thanks, as we have dedicated a sound system, as we remember those who went before us and served and still do. And we have felt your presence as we have sung with all our hearts. Go with us. May this sense of your closeness and immediacy and energy never leave us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.